to Creation Radio and TV. I'm your host, Mike Riddle, and we have a ministry called Creation Training Initiative. You can find out about us on our website, creationtraining.org. That's creationtraining.org, where we have many videos just like this on our website for free, and even our PowerPoint slides from all my presentations you can download for free. And you can also find out about our training courses where we come to your church and do full day training classes. Well, with us today, is Megan Eberhardt. Megan, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm here from Boise, Idaho, and I am a former fourth grade teacher. Now I have the privilege of serving as a mom full-time, as a wife, and as a Bible study leader at our church. Well, I like that last part, Bible study leader. And also you said fourth grade teacher. Yes. Aren't those the toughest ones of all? <laughs> no, I loved fourth, love grade. fourth grade. I find the elementary really hard. They're scary to me. <laughs> well, you know, it's actually prepared me well to teach ladies Bible study. And I say that because um, as a fourth grade teacher, you learn to communicate at an adult level, but keeping your illustrations very simple. And we all need practice in keeping our talk about the gospel very simple and very straightforward so that anyone, including a fourth grader, can understand it. Well, I like that because I agree with you. It's a great place to learn to not assume people know things. Yes. Because you teach in fourth, fifth, sixth grade, you really have to bring it down to that level and just can't assume they know all these big fancy words. Yes. Matter of fact, you don't even need to use the big fancy words most of the time with adults. Yes. And honestly, in teaching ladies Bible study, We've found great joy in going back to the gospel over and over again and really defining terms like grace that we can sometimes take for granted that people understand. Now, Bible study teacher, were you trained anywhere to teach or do you just say, or did your church just say anybody available? Well, no, of course we have to have standards for teachers. And so my training came through a form of inductive Bible study training but also through many, many years of sitting under good Bible teaching. I like that. Uh, I like the fact that you're a well-trained teacher. You just didn't come in and say, I would like to teach this. I think we need to do a lot more of that in our churches today. Yes. Make sure our Sunday school teachers are well-trained on how to communicate, teach, and facilitate where they know how to draw information out from people. Absolutely. So I like the fact that you're a well-trained teacher. Now you talk about Bible study teaching. What courses have you just recently taught? This year we went through the book of Titus and so your lovely wife Leslie invited me here today. We studied together and we were able to develop some illustrations that were really helpful to the ladies in understanding these concepts of sound doctrine and how do we grow in God's grace. Well tell us a little bit about what you taught in Titus. I, I find Titus very fascinating because I went through the same Bible state you taught from on the men's side there. Sure. And I found him fascinating. Yes, He's absolutely. He's my kind of person. Well, it's neat because Paul dropped off Titus on the island of Crete and there were some things that needed to be fixed in that new church and he was establishing leaders and setting things in order. So we see a really neat pattern of what is the church supposed to look like and what are we to be as believers. And so as we do as we dived into those concepts, we really realized that we needed to go back to the ground level of our faith and really look at what is grace, what is the gospel, and really come to an understanding of what is a God-centered gospel. And I know that you really do train people well in understanding that through the book of Genesis, which really is the bedrock of the Bible. Well, you just said three big terms there, grace, uh, the, the gospel, and man-centered versus, or, or rather than most people are man-centered, they should be God-centered. Right. That sounds like a 12-week course just on those <laughs> topics. It was all year. <laughs> yes. But uh, you, you mentioned the gospel and the, laying the groundwork. Yes. And a lot of people I find in churches today, even in many of our Christian schools, don't understand the full gospel. They're starting in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as the gospel. Yes, that is the core of the gospel, mm -hmm. but they forget about something called the foundation for the gospel. Absolutely. And when I teach the gospel, I teach it to all levels, not just grade school, but I teach it to people who've been Christians supposedly for 20, 30 years, don't know or understand the full message of the gospel. And I like to start with what we have in common, John 3:16. Everybody understands that. Well, right. I say everybody, but most people do. Right. For God sent his only begotten son. But then I take them to John 3:17 
which is critical for understanding the gospel. For God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That word saved there is critical. Why do we need to be saved and what do we need to be saved from? If you want to understand the gospel, you must be able to answer those two questions. Megan, that takes us back to Genesis 1.1. Not anywhere else, but Genesis 1-1, that God is the creator of all things. That means since he's the creator, he owns us. He sets the rules and standards for how we are to live, means his word is absolute truth. And that's why we call him Lord. Then it goes on to say his creation was perfect in Genesis 1-31. Then he gives this one rule for first people, Adam and Eve. You know what they're teaching in our seminaries today? Adam and Eve are not real people. Oh, they don't have a gospel anymore, do they? Right. They really don't have a gospel. Those are the false teachings that are going around the world today. Mm -hmm. But gave Adam and Eve one rule. And he said, if you break this rule, there's going to be a penalty called death. Well, guess what Adam and Eve did? They broke, broke the rule. Death came because of sin. And now we're in a situation where we're separated from a perfect and holy God with no hope. Mm -hmm. That's what we need to understand. To understand all the good news, we need to understand the bad news. At that point, we have no hope. The fall. Yes, because we're separated from that perfect and holy God. And the Bible says in the New Testament, for all has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the punishment is death. Mm -hmm. Then we have to get to the good news. We're sitting here, no hope. Mm -hmm. But the good news, you know where that starts? Genesis 3.15, mm -hmm. where God makes the first proclamation of victory and a savior. Mm -hmm. That's why we need to understand our foundations, which starts in Genesis. Amen. And they're not teaching that in most churches. So thank you for bringing that up. Now, you talk a lot about foundations. You teach a lot about foundations. And you mentioned something called grace in there. Mm -hmm. So would you expound on that for, for people out there? Absolutely. Well, as you described, we have a hopeless situation when we're separated from God by our sin. And until we understand the sickness and the separation of that situation, then we really don't understand a need for grace. But what makes it amazing is that it's an undeserved gift, that we had a Savior who was willing to come as grace incarnate. It says in Titus 2.11, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. But we don't understand that whole idea of Him coming as the embodiment of grace until we understand the seriousness of our condition apart from him. There is no hope. And so in that moment of grace, he comes and he lived the perfect life that we could never live. He died the death that we deserve. As you said, the wages of sin is death. And he rose, that's very crucial as well, conquering sin and death. And that is where we ultimately find our hope is in that concept of regeneration and the ability to return again to Genesis. And, that, and we actually see that in Titus as well. That was exciting when we saw in Titus 3, 5, he saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Again, that old, whole idea that we don't deserve it by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. So that word regeneration means Genesis again. And so we see that full circle concept that we don't come into relationship with Christ on the basis of our deeds. We need his perfect life, his death in our place for the punishment for sin. And then again, that concept of rising in, out of the ashes of our sin into a into a relationship with him and so this picture emerged of growth we went to the ground level we went to genesis we learned that grace is an undeserved gift but it's god stepping into time and taking the penalty for of sin for us and we made it all about who he is and his character it wasn't about yes. anything that we That's could the must god center versus man center right and so we we kept talking about how scripture is the authority and in our culture, we are blown to and fro by the waves of, of false doctrine, as you mentioned, but also our feelings. You know, we live in a culture where what you feel is the most important thing about you. And so we have to really evaluate, are we basing our salvation on what we feel or are we basing our salvation on the facts of God's word? Do you mean if I give uh, all my money, <laughs> to all $20 of it to somebody, I'm right. not gonna go to heaven? Right. Or if, if I do what I'm supposed to do, I take out the trash every time my wife tells me I'm not going to heaven if I do it all the time. Right. Wow. 
we make a pretty good team here you know, <laughs> with the gospel. I got to give the bad news, and you got to give the good, the good news. news. Yes, yes. It's a good team there. It is the good news that it's not on the basis of deeds. However, you then see throughout the book of Titus that we, as we're saved, are to put good deeds on display in our lives. And so we start to see this idea that we're not saved by good deeds, but that we're supposed to be putting good deeds on display. And so we start to want to jump to this idea of what does it look like for me to put God's character on display, but we neglect a really important part of the process of growth. We have that moment of salvation where we understand the gospel and grace for the first time, and we understand the seriousness of sin and the way that Christ paid that penalty. But then we want to jump to immediately having these changed lives without the middle piece, which is the root system. So if, if salvation represents a seed, we all know that a seed needs a well-developed root system in order to stand and to ultimately become a mature plant. You know, I, I like this picture. My <laughs> wife came home and told me all about this. Yes. Use a flower illustration. Yes. Well, yeah. first it was a line across the board that yes. said we have to go to ground level. Yes. And then we had the seed of salvation. And then we started the roots growing. But we were talking about how do we develop our roots? as believers, how do we stand in grace? Because we're saved by grace, but the Bible also says we stand in grace. And so from that picture, we started to talk about this idea of sound doctrine. And even those terms have to be defined yes. because that's very off-putting to people. What do you mean by sound doctrine? And so we looked at those words. The word sound is a Greek word, hugiaino, which is actually... Would you say that again? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I should. I'm not a Greek expert. But the idea is that it's from a Greek word from which we get our word hygiene. So we started, instead of saying the word sound, we, use, we used the synonym healthy, hygiene. And so sound equals healthy, doctrine equals teaching, to keep it simple fourth grade level. So we started talking about healthy teaching. And so this soil of sound doctrine was going back to the sufficiency of Scripture. Is Scripture sufficient to help me grow as a seed, to develop that root system that I need to stand? And so we kept going back to the rich resources of the Bible and the realization that we need teachers, but we also need to be speaking sound doctrine to each other as everyday people in the church, young men and older men, young women and older women, and that we need this connectedness in that soil of sound doctrine. And then from that, we finally see that transforming truth. We see that picture of the Holy Spirit enabling growth, but it's something that happens from the inside out. And again, the seed works, right? It's this tiny seed, but then we see this big, beautiful, mature plant but it's a work of the Holy Spirit from beginning to end, from the seed to the soil of sound doctrine to the Spirit-infused growth. And then we see those good deeds, the character of God on display in people's lives. And then it brings us back full circle because when people see the character of God in our lives, then they want to know what's different about us, and that's our opportunity to share the gospel. But again, if we can't go back to that fourth grade definition of what is the gospel, yes. then how do we ever have the opportunity to share it? And that's why so many of our youth today are confused about the Bible because they don't have that sound doctrine. They don't understand the gospel starts in the book of Genesis because it's not being taught in most churches. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we have a lot of false information coming into the churches. And in the business I'm in, in Creation Evolution, what we find is a lot of people bringing this idea of millions of years, which is a false information. It's mm -hmm. not sound doctrine. Absolutely. But I want to go back to this uh, roots and ground level and seed. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you drew this picture of a flower. Mm -hmm. and, and most people just see the flower. Explain right. what we're talking about there. Right. Well, we talked about as women how we do. We get very caught up in wanting to appear good. And women worry a lot. Men do too. Men do too. Men do too. But we worry that we are not representing Christ well. Am I, am I a good enough wife? Am I a good enough mom? And we want to appear good to other people. And so in that, even though our desire is to please our Lord, we somehow turn it back into this man-centered gospel or these are the things that I have to do like a checklist, these rules and regulations. 
to appear good to others so that they'll want to hear the gospel. And so we forget that all of that is empowered by the Holy Spirit, that it's his resources, it's his washing of regeneration, it's his soil of sound doctrine, it's his truth that transforms us from the inside out. So we go to the flower without looking first at the roots. And the roots are soaking ourselves in good, healthy teaching so that we can be equipped to then share Christ with others. And we share Christ with others by showing his character in our lives. In chapter 2 of Titus, we see a lot of those character traits that we be sound in speech. Well, how are, the, how are healthy things going to come out of my mouth unless I first saturated my heart and mind in what the words of Scripture say? And so every part of who we are in the world and as Christians comes from this concept of being sound in doctrine, healthy in teaching. You also see these ideas of being loving and being temperate and dignified and sensible. And all of those, all of those traits come from understanding the Word of God. But, you got me in trouble right there. Dignified? <laughs> <laughs> I'm in trouble. <laughs> right. But the problem is when we immediately go to wanting to put on display what we haven't spent the time to fill our minds with and our hearts with and our lives with through the Word of God. We make it about our efforts rather than the Word of God transforming us from the inside out. Oh, I like that, uh, that, that flower illustration. Mm -hmm. Too often, again, that's what people see. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what, what's being taught in a lot of churches is the flower. Right. But they don't have the foundation for why the flower is there. Right. The roots, and they don't go back to that structure. And that's the gospel starts at the root level mm -hmm. in Genesis. Mm -hmm. And they're not teaching that. And we, we do. We, have to, we went back to it every single week because even as seasoned believers, we forget that I need God's grace as much today as the first day that I believed. And that, that whole idea that eternal life starts right now. We tend to think of the idea of our future with Christ and heaven, but we don't think about the fact that the moment that seed is planted, it starts to grow. We're supposed to be growing in God's grace right now, and it's supposed to be evident in our lives. And His eternal character is on display if we'll allow Him to work in our lives through His Word. So what you're saying there is not just come on Sunday and then go home and do whatever. <laughs> right. It says we're to continue to work on our faith. We're study to show ourselves approved. Yes. So we have those commands in there to continue yes. to grow. I like that concept. Eternity, eternal life starts when that seed is planted. And I borrowed that <laughs> phrase from our pastor. And you know, that's that context of being in the church is really important because we, we talked about how we tend to view ourselves as these isolated flowers, like God is growing me. But in America, we have this very autonomous attitude where we don't really need other believers. We can do it all on our own. And what we have to remember is Jesus's analogy from John 15, that he's the vine and I'm just this little branch. And yes, by his grace, I will bear fruit. That little tiny branch, we'll have a bunch of grapes on it. But I'm part of a big vineyard. I'm not just by myself. And so we have to stay connected to the body. We have to have people that are giving sound doctrine in authority, positions of authority, and all of that is spelled out in the book of Titus. Yes, even in the ministry we're in, yes, I do a lot of the teaching, but I need people around me to give yes. me advice and check out to make sure I don't go astray. Right. So we're all part of the body. We're different parts. Each part has a different function in yes. there that they all work together as a whole. Yes. What a concept. What a concept. And it's right there in the Bible. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Now, uh, you, you taught Titus. Uh, is that information on the web where anybody can get that information? What a powerful book. I, I like Titus because he was Paul's bulldog. Uh -huh. He got sent in to do the tough situations. I, I like that. Would have made a good United States Marine there. <laughs> get in there and straighten things out. Right. We need more Tituses in mm. our churches today. Yes, we do. We need more pastors who are willing to clean things up mm -hmm. and get, like you say, to the root mm -hmm. of doctrine, good, sound doctrine, and not give up and say, oh, we're here for unity. We want unity. Right. But they sacrifice doctrine. They don't read the Bible. It says, yes, we want unity, but not at the expense of sound doctrine. Right. There were people in the church that Titus was told to silence yes. because of the issue of false doctrine. So it is important that it be in the context of the church. And I do want to thank 
uh, my pastor, Jim Harris, and I do want people to know that his faithful teaching is available on the web. And it is an example of sound doctrine. Some people don't even know what sound doctrine sounds like. So you could go to hbc-boise.org and you could see a whole breadth of sermon series on the book. I mean, we really have the bookends. You have Genesis, you have Revelation, we have Titus. I've taught through the book of First Peter. We've gone through Galatians. On the web, there's some awesome resources for First and Second Thessalonians. I mean, there's entire books of the Bible where people can can work through and hear what sound doctrine sounds like. Are there worksheets they can get on there too? I hope so. Yes. Let's, let's say coming soon. <laughs> yes, say coming soon. <laughs> but I would highly recommend this this uh, website. You say the website again? It's hbc-boise.org. Yes, they have full explanations, full sermons broken into sections out there, mm -hmm. verse by verse, powerful teaching by a mm -hmm. Greek scholar. Mm -hmm. Don't miss these. If you're looking for a place to get good, sound doctrine, without watering it down, mm -hmm. compromising it, go to this website and start listening to some of these sermons. Mm -hmm. And I think it will change the way you look at the Bible. Absolutely. So I, I like these concepts. Now, uh, some more about uh, what you're going to teach next. Do you have an idea what you're going to teach next? I think our next series is going to work through the book of Colossians. Oh, I like I like Colossians, especially if there's a verse, couple verses in there like Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him all things were created. Um, it even talks about the things that are visible and invisible. You know what that means? All things. It really is beautiful, no matter what book of the Bible that you're studying, that it all fits together so beautifully. And you do, you find yourself going back to Genesis over yes. and over yes. again. Well, Genesis is, is a very strong, because it is our foundation. Matter of fact, the first three chapters of Genesis is the reason the rest of the Bible had to take place. Right. People don't understand the importance of that. And that's the section Satan is attacking because mm -hmm. he knows better than a lot of pastors today and Christian university professors that Genesis is the foundation for almost every one of our biblical doctrines. And they need to stop compromising that, Truly. adding billions of years in there, making it man-centered right. versus God-centered. Right. We have too much of that going on. It goes back to that, that concept of feelings versus facts. And so... You know, we hear things in popular media and and it feels good and it sounds okay and we don't have a root system that's helping us to check those things out. And so we just go with whatever sounds good. And the reality is that we have to stop trusting our feelings and go back to the facts of God's Word. And if popular culture doesn't jive with God's Word, then the problem isn't with God's Word, it's with popular yes, culture. I like that. Very good. <laughs> Because we don't need to keep reinventing things. Right. We don't need to come up with different ways to explain the Bible. Right. All that does is bring in more heresy, right. more false doctrines. Let's stop trying to change the Bible. Mm -hmm. And So we've talked about grace. We've talked about the root structure in Genesis. Mm -hmm. We talked about God-centered versus man-centered. And I really like that part, grace. That needs to be taught more in our churches, just like Ephesians 2.8.9. By grace we are saved, and it's not what we can do. Right. It makes it very powerful right there. Mm -hmm. To understand grace is we can't do anything. Our faith doesn't even come from us. God even gives us the faith to believe in Him. That's what we loved about the picture of the flower is the ladies just it kind of exploded on the board, and they were like, He's the light, and He is the water, you know, washing us in, in His Word, and He is the soil, and He is really, like you said, the seed, because none of it comes from us. It's all His rich resources, and it's all contained in God's Word. So we, we started to see over and over again how beautiful it is that when we have those feelings of guilt or even questioning, am I a believer? I can go back to God's Word. I don't have to rely on feelings. I don't have to be swayed by fears. I can go back to the bedrock of the Bible and understand these things. Well, Megan, it's been a joy to have you here, uh, and you're an example of a wonderful teacher. My wife comes home excited every Bible study <laughs> that what a great teacher. We need more women teachers out there that can teach the women and uh, get them grounded in God's Word, because it's usually the women that take now care of Now you're the using the flower imagery, <laughs> yes. grounded uh -oh. in God's Word. <laughs> yes, I think it's a great example yes. that, again, we see the flower but we don't understand the roots and the importance of the root structure very often. And we let that go too much in theology.
And just that humbling. We don't have dirty knees from kneeling in the dirt and really getting into the study of God's yes. Word. And we do. There has to be that discipline to go back to God's Word. Well, this has been a pleasure to have you on. We'll have to you on again. The next, next time you teach a course, we'll have to have you come back and talk about that. Sounds great. Again, you can go to the website. And again, that website? hbc-boise.org. <laughs> to get good, sound teaching from a Greek scholar, Go to that website and listen to some of these sermons. And they're broken into small segments, verse by verse. He even explains the meaning of the words mm -hmm. there. So this is powerful expository teaching you'll get from that website. And I want to thank you again very much for coming on. And again, we need women who are willing to get trained how to teach God's Word and then send you into your churches and start teaching the younger women and the medium-sized women and the, <laughs> and the more mature women how to understand God's Word. I want to thank you and God bless all of you out there. Again, my name is Mike Riddle. Our website is creationtraining.org. Go to that website. You'll find out about our training courses where we come to your church and we train the youth all the way through adults. We have courses like basic creation training, one on apologetics that trains you how to answer questions like, can you show me any evidence God really does exist? Or how about this one? How can you call God good when he allows bad things to happen? We answer questions like that. We show you how to answer that so you too can go out there and be witnesses for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you and God bless you. Our online videos are free for anyone to view or download. However, it does take finances to continue producing these programs. If these lessons have been helpful, you might consider supporting the Ministry of Creation Training Initiative. You can mail a check to CTI, Post Office Box 2415, Eagle, Idaho 83616. Or you can go to our website, creationtraining.org, and make your donations that way. Your donations of $20, $100 or more will enable us to continue to share the good news of God's Word worldwide. As it states in Jeremiah 32:17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. There is nothing too hard for you. Thank you and God bless.